I would like to all welcome you both here at the Press Club Concordia in the beautiful city of Vienna, as well as far away and very far away, uh, where you will be watching and participating in front of your screens. My name is Christoph Plater, as Jackie said, and I'm the director of the media program for sub saharan Africa of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung based in Johannesburg in South Africa. Many of us, and I'd like to say that because I feel very strongly about it, have traveled a long way to be here. We were filling in papers at least three times uh, the amount of papers that we usually have to fill in. This time it is vaccination cards, travel registrations, COVID test forms, and a few others. But I think it is really, really worth it because there's nothing more exciting than the direct exchange with people. All the more so I'm thrilled that we can speak about business models for media in dire circumstances with four participants here on the panel. These are Veronica Monk from Budapest, Dapo Oloronyomi from Abuja, Sidat Varadarayan from Delhi, and Sanzu Samlibel from Istanbul. Welcome to the four of you. All four are publishers, editors-in-chief or former reporters who have come to realize that good media needs a sound financial foundation, and that leaders in media also have to be people who do not shy away from numbers and Excel sheets. Because without understanding these, we would not be able to tell the ever so important story that needs to be told to a wider audience. And all four here have made the experience that running a media business is even more difficult if it does not please the powers that be. The term repression that is being used in the title of this discussion certainly applies to many circumstances. And we all could agree, I guess, that the media environment is different in a country that calls itself a democracy like the one in India, as opposed to, let's say, the political system in Turkey. Repression is not only imposed by governments, um, as maybe the definition of the title might suggest, which is generally seen in media circles as the enemy number one, but I do think there are more enemies and there are even governments that are not enemies, but there are many other factors that cause the unease to research a story or that make you ask yourself if this advert might maybe compromise you and your publication. In the next 50 minutes, we are going to talk about the constant need to harmonize the need for good and substantial journalism with the economic and political pressures one endures. And each of our participants will now talk for about five minutes about their particular challenges. And because we still need time for discussion and for a few comments from viewers and spectators, I will try to keep the five minute limit with Swiss precision. It's a very bad habit to look at one's cell phone when one moderates. Forgive me if I do that during this panel from time to time. The reason behind it being very simple, technology has it that the, uh, the Zoom questions that come in the chat group are going to be transmitted to, um, uh, to my cell phone. So it's not that I'm texting my family that everything is in order. I'm just, I'm just trying to find out who is asking what. First, I welcome Veronica Monk formerly with the news platform Index in Hungary, which was then attacked by business people close to the government of Viktor Orban, and she's now editor-in-chief of Telex, which took on most of the journals from Index, I believe, Veronica, when they walked out. Telex is highly successful, it seems, in an environment that is not conducive for critical journalism, and that in a member state of the European Union. How is that, Veronica? Thank you very much. I will also check sometimes my phone because my notes are there. It's not because I'm texting my family. Uh, welcome everyone. Yeah, uh, as Christoph mentioned, I'm co-editor-in-chief at Telex, which is now the largest crowdfunding-based news site in Hungary. Uh, the, in this EU country, which is the poster <laughs> country of uh, basically state capture in media, uh, our, our story at Telex uh, and before that at Index is that I think it's a very good example uh, how uh, state capture in the media field is working. I don't know how familiar are you 
with the Hungarian media sphere, but I can share five factors which, uh, uh, which, uh, which, which is really important uh, in the media landscape. One is that the Hungarian media landscape has fractured into these two distinct parts. Uh, one, the majority uh, contains media outlets that has strong connections to the government, strong connections to politics, to politicians, to, uh, to oligarchs, business people who have strong connections to, to the politics, to politicians, and the smaller uh, part uh, still remaining uh, independent critical newspapers, which are mostly online, which is a problem because people who consume their news not on the internet, uh, then basically, or basically they only have one choice, but that to consume the pro-governmental uh, news sources. Uh, in Hungary, the public uh, broadcasting companies funded by Hungarian taxpayers are mouthpieces, megaphones of the government. So basically they are not fulfilled their, their public uh, 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 service. Uh, we have a very special uh, media conglomerate called Central European Press and Media Foundation. This is a centralized organization uh, launched uh, three years ago by uh, loyalists of the ruling party. Uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, that these 500 media outlets like TV channels, radios, online newspapers, tabloids, were uh, donated to this organization as gifts. Uh, and since then, they basically produce uh, pro-governmental propaganda. Uh, the advertisement market is also heavily influenced by politics in my country, uh, which is a problem because traditionally, uh, media business is uh, supposed to be fi financed by advertisement. Uh, but, but for critical independent outlets, it's really, really hard, especially that the, that the basically one of the largest or the largest actor on the advertise, in the advertisement market is the Hungarian state itself. And they pick where they spend their money and where they're not. On the not side is usually the critical uh, media outlet. And, and the fifth factor, which is important, that uh, access to information, which is extremely hard in my country. Uh, uh, of course, that's the job, we ask questions, but uh, uh, usually we do not get answers from, from officials, from state uh, authorities. Uh, so we need to be creative. Last year, when all of us, the whole newsroom quit from index because, uh, uh, because there, there was a, a obvious politically influenced takeover uh, on the newspaper and the editor in chief Sabolj Dur was fired the next day, 90 of us quit. Uh, and there was a large protest uh, on the streets of Budapest beside freedom of press and, and, and thousands of people were marching and shouting uh, beside Beside freedom of press, and then we decided, uh, okay, we create a new outlet, uh, and that's what Telex is. Uh, and we realized that if people go to the street, because that was basically the moment when they realized that there, there was a couple of other, we are not the last one standings, but there are very few critical outlets. Uh, and, and I think that was the moment when, they, when people in Hungary realized that they need to contribute financially if they would like to consume fact-based quality journalism. So, so basically that was the message. What we did, I went on YouTube, I turned to the camera and said, please give us money. Not in this way, a more appropriate, proper level <laughs> uh, uh, with a proper method. But basically that was the message. I have been worked at Index for almost two decades and my colleagues as well. So pe people, our readers knew us. So they knew that we can create uh, quality journalism and they reacted quite well. The time is finished, right? Okay. So basically my, our example is uh, 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 the message is that, that you can believe in your readers. If, uh, if you can provide quality journalism for them, they, they will contribute financially. That's, that's, our, that's what our example tells for the journalism field, I guess. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica. We will have more opportunity to, to discuss Sorry. this. I think that um, 
the particular example of Hungary, which has been cited here in the morning a couple of times uh, and also in the last session, is very interesting to, 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 to many people. Um, and also this kind of business model that you are developing now, uh, where, where readers actually make uh, you uh, survive and make you pay uh, salaries and, and do investigations. We move over to the African continent to Dapo Oloronyomi. He's the founder and boss of the Premium Times in the Nigerian capital, Abuja. He's a personal friend and a long-standing fan of Cast Media Africa. And Dapo has um, suffered himself and, and his colleagues a lot at the hands of uh, various uh, regimes in Nigeria. Uh, in particular, the, the, the very bloodthirsty regime of Sonia Bacha. If you compare, compare those days, Dapo, when you had to go underground and then eventually into exile with today, how does repression for media in your home country, Nigeria, look like today? Well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, it's very tempting to imagine that after 30 years of uh, a very brutal military dictatorship in Nigeria uh, in 1999, we transited into some form of democracy, obviously civil rule, um, and that things will be resolved. So for context, just to give a little bit, um, between 84 and say 94, um, Nigeria, that's 30 years. I think on most accounts, uh, scholars believe that this, the Nigerian media, uh, with the possible exception of South Africa on the apartheid, no other media has uh, undergone a kind of ferocious attack. So you have killings, you have exiles, you have shut down, indeed, the government newspapers and radio stations themselves were shut down. Uh, I mean, the regimes were really crazy, but this military regime. So 1999, fast forward. So uh, we became, we went back to democracy. Uh, but the instincts, all the structures that had been built under military rule still persists and endures. Um, the laws were there, policy were there, but also because you know how it is, um, a country with the kind of extractive costs rather than a blessing of oil had also made um, soldiers super rich. And so they transited themselves to become the new political class and then got into parliament, got into other elective offices and became also executive branch uh, uh, elements in the country. So indeed it is uh, it is tempting to say that, okay, things have changed because obviously we're not seeing the kind of crazy shutdowns that we were seeing under the military administration, but now it's taken a different form. Uh, I'll just allude to one quick uh, reference and everybody, most of you here, I will imagine um, kind of the Twitter ban where uh, a president, you know, had made some comments and the community rules of Twitter seem to have been flouted and they asked that the Nigerian government should think about, you know, deleting it. And obviously Nigeria, you know, 200 million, the guess, most populous country in Africa, everybody felt, I mean, people around political circles felt really uh, offended that Twitter was asking the Nigerian president to, to delete his tweet and, then of course Twitter had to delete that. And then to, in response, uh, the government then banned Twitter. This is the kind of instinct that now prevails in the country, such that in 1990, uh, 2019, we had four new laws. Uh, this will probably be the most tentorian piece of legislation, at least that I know about in the African continent. Uh, add that to the fact that already in the books, we have something like 28 uh, media constraining laws that we were carrying from the bad, bad days of military regime. Um, now, what does all that do for media practice, good journalism? Indeed, it just makes that it cripples, you know, our, our capacity to do the work. So that in the advent of COVID, um, 23 newspapers, 
um, small community outlets uh, went under in Nigeria. Years of military rule had um, bad economic choices, made uh, economic management impossible. Um, I remember that um, 1999, we were still in the local currency, was something close to about a hundred dollar to hundred naira. Yesterday it was five hundred and fifty. Um, so in fact, the economics of doing <laughs> journalism is totally uh, unsurmountable. That's in the country today. So if you look at it, that nobody is putting a gun running after you. Yes, <laughs> from the point of view of journalistic practice, you could say, well, things really appear to have changed, but. You know, um, the data, what data is telling us is that indeed things have gotten worse. Thank you very much, um, Dapo. I think um, when it comes to financing such business models and, 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 and tapping resources, we will have room for discussion later on because I, need, I think Nigeria and the Premium Times is a very, very interesting example um, how one can create a bundle of different streams of finance, you know, like tapping the diaspora and 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 introducing premium memberships and so on and so forth in order to survive in these dire economic circumstances. We move over to India to see that Varadarayan, who lives in a country where people are being killed because of their religion by Muslim and Hindu militants. Yet um, we still look at India as a democracy and. Uh, uh, the federal system is very impressive, and as opposed to Pakistan and other countries in the region, we we think that in such a such a such a space, such a democratic space, media must have been a heyday and must have a good life. And I'm sure, see that it's not like that. Your publication, The Wire, is having a Hindi version, one in Urdu, one in Marathi, and you are trying. I saw on Twitter you're trying to become as independent as possible from grants and philanthropists. If the readers and the media consumers are your financiers, does that make you independent from any kind of pressure? Uh, that's a great question, and I will get to it. But I think maybe one minute, um, I should explain the context, a little bit of uh, you know, the media environment in India. And in particular, when we talk about the media business under repression, I think it's important to uh, sketch out for you the contours of what this repression involves. Um, repression, quote unquote, would take the form of um, economic pressure, uh, which could be overt in terms of the denial of uh, government advertising to media that's critical, as uh, uh, you know, Veronica mentioned is happening in Hungary. This is very much the case in India. This is taxpayers' money, so the government ought not to have a political discretion, but it, it does. And uh, apart from that, you have uh, 101 levers of influence and pressure that a vindictive government can use against media organizations that have multiple businesses. So even without making it appear as if uh, the media, quote unquote, is being targeted, it's possible to raid uh, or to investigate the tax um, inconsistencies of media houses that have multiple businesses uh, as a way of putting pressure. So we see quite a lot of that happening. Uh, we've seen uh, blatant misuse of the investigative agencies and tax authorities against independent uh, digital publications, most recently with uh, uh, NewsClick and News Laundry, which are two digital platforms that are critical of the government. Um, income tax people spent a whole day in their offices um, confiscating files, electronic records, and so on. So that's on the uh, economic side. Uh, this could also take the form of pressure on uh, donations. So the wire, for example, is funded by uh, by donations. We are, we are a nonprofit, and uh, what we've seen is that after an initial uh, leg up that we got from uh, philanthropy. Um, it became harder and harder for uh, high net worth individuals to make donations to the wire without attracting adverse attention from the government, and they've tended to back off, um, which is one of the reasons why we also felt it's better to not depend on them, but to 
uh, actually broad base our, our, uh, our finances. Uh, so that's on the economic uh, or the business side. Um, advertising, there's pressure also on private advertisers. We've seen examples of uh, a couple of channels that have lost, which are critical of the government, NDTV, for example, which uh, for, for a period of time lost uh, a number of lucrative private advertisers because uh, it is said the government leaned on them. And on the flip side, uh, very much like Hungary, we have a large section of the media which is pro-government, pro-establishment, and uh, all the stops are pulled out to make sure that these media channels are flushed with advertising. So uh, private companies that want to suck up to the government, uh, of course, state governments uh, run by the ruling party and the central government, all lavishly uh, advertise in uh, pro-government media. And uh, even media which is on the fence, uh, depends so much on this financial support that uh, they are willing to fall on the sword. And I'll give you an example of the Indian Express, which recently, which is a, a critical newspaper, which recently ran an, uh, a cover page, a front page advertisement, extolling the virtues of uh, one of the ruling BJP uh, leaders, state governments in Uttar Pradesh, it's the largest state. And this, this advertorial or advertisement had photographs that were lifted from other states, lifted from the US and passed off as the accomplishments of this leader. And when people pointed this out on Twitter, because you can't hide anything anymore, right? It's foolish to think that you can get away with this. Uh, somehow the newspaper stepped forward to apologize and said, this is our fault. Everybody knows that advertisers bring advertisements and you, you, you put them, you're not responsible for the content in that way, but the newspaper saw uh, an obligation to uh, own up and take the blame for that so that the politician wouldn't be. So, so there is the financial side of repression, but that's one part of it. You have political, legal. Um, defamation is a major problem, civil and criminal. The Wire faces a number of cases, lots of other media platforms do too. But of late, over the past year and a half, we've seen increasing reliance by the police in different parts of India on uh, regular criminal law to prosecute journalists for stories that they've done. And uh, we ourselves have been victims of that. We're fighting it, others are too. But this is, uh, represents a new and qualitative escalation in, um, in official repression of media. Now, in terms of the business side, just I'll wrap up in one minute. Uh, you know, for us, uh, the wire began with the premise that the, the only guarantor of independent journalism in a country like ours where the media was coming under strain was going to be to depend on uh, donations and support from readers. Uh, and I'm happy to say that six years down the, down the, down the road, uh, reader donations account for something like 70 to 80% of our, of our monthly revenue. I asked my guy, my accounts guy to send me the details so I could share the figures with you. Um, in, so I have data for 2018, 2019, 2020 and 2021 calendar year not financial. Uh, and in 2018, when we began to collect uh, aggressively reader donations, we clocked around, uh, I think it was eight or nine lakhs a month, which is roughly $10,000 to $12,000. Uh, in 2019, that went up to uh, around $18,000. In 2020, it went up to around 25,000. And in the calendar year of 21, uh, so far, we are collecting um, month on month on at an average around 33, 33 lakh rupees, which is around, I think, if my math is not right, but not wrong, around forty around $40,000 a month uh, from reader donations. And the, the balance comes from advertising. So for us, uh, we found the public actually quite willing to, uh, to support us. I think the strategy that you're betting on, Veronica, is exactly our strategy. Uh, readers uh, are sick and tired of pro-establishment media, the second type of media that doesn't deliver the reality to them and are willing in modest and small ways to, to donate. And, 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 and that's our experience. The only, uh, I mean, I was telling Jackie in one of the, in one of the uh, breaks that, you know, we have, we've reached a stage now where we can, we are confident that we can continue the wires editorial operations indefinitely. I think we can sustain ourselves. Uh, the challenge will come in terms of being able to grow to the next level. So in other words, how do you then parlay reader donations and advertising income to a situation where you can take that next step up so that you uh, deepen, increase your coverage, widen it, 
uh, that's the challenge that we are facing and thank you uh, um, looking forward to in, uh, interactions on this and i think it's 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 also an observation that we have made in many other places in the world during the pandemic that the preparedness of people to actually pay and donate uh, has definitely has definitely increased which is an encouraging sign finally i would like to introduce sanzu shamdibel from istanbul she's editor in chief of the online newspaper duvar english and she has a long track record of challenging the methods of the ruling AKP and of President Erdogan in particular. How does one do business, Shanzu, and pay salaries in such an atmosphere? Well, it's, it's almost impossible, but well, we made it happen. Um, first of all, maybe uh, just like Sidar did, it's, it's better to give the con context and how I ended up here. Uh, by the way, um, I am the editor-in-chief of uh, Duvar English, which is going to be uh, two years old next month. Uh, but it's the sister newspaper, the uh, digital newspaper of uh, Gazete Duvar, which was founded um, in 2016, uh, just a couple of weeks later uh, after the coup attempt. And it was a very courageous uh, thing to do. Uh, to launch a new independent um, digital platform in Turkey while the Turkish government was cracking down on existing um, critical media organizations. Uh, I wasn't there. And uh, interestingly, I, I was uh, still with Turiet, uh, which once used to be, I don't know how to describe it, Washington Post or New York Times of mm -hmm. Turkey. And uh, the owner, the former owner of Turiet has been um, um, a loyal contributor to IPI in the past. Uh, uh, and um, before uh, joining Duvar uh, with, uh, with this independent uh, journey, independent and project, I was the Washington correspondent of Hurriet. Uh, I was posted there in 2017 uh, after Trump got elected. And, you know, that was the idea to uh, cover the Trump White House. And um, unfortunately, just a year after uh, I was posted there in 2018, uh, the former uh, owner of Huriet uh, was forced uh, to sell uh, the newspaper, but not only the newspaper, the whole media company, which I can compare to what Rupert Murdoch has, and Aydın Doğan was that for Turkey. And he was forced to sell the huge empire, including CNN Turk. And that, uh, that sale, made it very obvious for me that I couldn't operate as a journalist from that moment on, because the new family who bought the company, um, just like you described, uh, pro-government uh, business people, and they just take orders. And um, when uh, you kind of like phrase repression, and in Turkey right now, the, the form of, rep I mean, the repression takes the form of self-censorship for many of the uh, government controlled uh, companies. Uh, they are not, by the way, uh, owned by governments itself or government agencies. They are just uh, uh, owned by business people who have other stakes. Uh, they're building bridges, uh, they have banks, and this is like uh, they have to pay their due to uh, President Erdogan uh, in order to uh, get into those state tenders. And that's why self-censorship is the way to go for them. And when I was the Washington correspondent in Hurriyet, and when the company was sold, I like just in maybe four or five months, it became very evident that I was useless there because they were not printing any of my stories. And I had a column and they were taking down my column. And uh, I decided to resign. I, I went back to Istanbul. I sat down with my editor-in-chief and it was the day uh, Trump tweeted, it was an open threat to Turkish economy that if you're going to extend this military operation in Syria, uh, I'm going to crash your economy. So that was a direct threat, uh, threat from the Turkish uh, president, uh, the, uh, from the US pres president. What else could have been the headline of that day? And it wasn't in the paper. So <laughs> when I sat down with my editor in chief, I asked, where is the story? And he said, you know, you know, things are, and I said, look, I don't think you need me to print this newspaper because you are already doing that without me. And so what is happening? And he said, you know, uh, the, the boss is considering to fire you, but I was holding on to him. And I'm like, why? 
because it doesn't look that people like you leaving the reaction. So I was just an image problem at that moment and I resigned. Anyhow, so this is, uh, this is the current environment where we try to operate as independent platforms. So the most important thing for us is to keep integrity and to resist the tide and to do this on Turkish soil. And how do you pay salaries? How do you convince your advertisers to advertise with you? How do you convince your advertisers to advertise with you? Well, it was difficult in the first place. And it was, uh, our, we had angel investors, uh, Turkish people, Turkish business people, uh, small to medium size. Uh, they are not like the big names in the Turkish industrial uh, scene. And, uh, and as of today, they are still uh, paying uh, more than half of the expenditure. Uh, in five, six years time, Duar could only got like 45 to 50 percent of, of the uh, advertising revenues covering all costs of the whole operation, which is fairly small. But then what is happening is that we are still um, unlike, you know, in the last uh, two or three hours, we are talking about the new ways like of how to expand our readership uh, with the technology, digital, and then social media platforms. What we did uh, with Duar was a very old sort of experiment because we are kind of sticking to the slow journalism, quality journalism, trying to refrain from the clickbait area. But because the political um, developments in Turkey are so dramatic, uh, just like Nation explained, I mean, she has a huge uh, YouTube uh, following uh, and she has quite uh, a, few, a few million followers on Twitter. But when she speaks about the problems of the domestic politics, because people do not see that uh, on the TV, uh, on the prime TV channels, they kind of like blew to the screens. And this is what happened to us. Although we pushed for, uh, you know, slow journalism, long pieces, analysis, <laughs> And it was just the contrary of what was happening instantly on your, uh, on your uh, feeds on social media. It kind of like started growing on people. And then you get the trust from the people. But unfortunately, unlike India and unlike Hungary, in Turkey, um, people, um, people, I think, have a better relationship with um, consuming news, um, um, from TVs, from, from YouTube. But like when it comes to the readership, uh, leadership uh, loyalty, unfortunately, it's very weak in Turkey. Thank you, Shanzu. I, th th there's one thing that I, when I, when I listen to you four people, that, uh, that, that goes through my mind, and I would like to ask all of you that uh, and, and, and ask you to be as brief as possible if in your newsroom you have young people who don't recall in the nigerian case the very very bitter times those days back but in turkey and in india and in hungary you still the young ones still still see the status quo at the moment and becoming a journalist is maybe not a very desirable uh, uh, career path how are you convincing young people to follow in your footsteps, to become newsroom leaders, chief commentators, and so on and so forth? Well, first and foremost, I think journalism must be able uh, to attract uh, young people uh, from the point of view of livelihood. You know, it must be able to pay mm -hmm. your salaries mm -hmm. and very regularly, something that's really a big challenge in most African countries today. Uh, but besides that also, uh, journalism should be able to map, it gives some sense of uh, inspiration about those critical problems of that society. Uh, the traditions of courage and liberty that uh, good media had always uh, spoken around. And, Thanks, Dapo. Yeah. Veronica, how is that with you? Do you have a pile of applications for internships like that in a particular situation like the Hungarian one? Actually, we have. Uh, I, but but I don't. You, your question was that how I try to convince them. I never try to convince them. I just can share my my opinion, which is that I passionately believe 
in the function of our profession. And I can share that, okay, the situation is far from perfect, but, but people really in every democracy uh, need to have facts, need to have fact-based information to, to, to have their free decisions in their lives. So basically that's our, that's our purpose, to give information and they will, they will think about things what they would like. I also teach journalism at the largest Hungarian university and you would think that there is not so many young people who would like to be journalists, but the truth is, that there is a large proportion who, who wants to be just because of the cause to somehow contribute to freedom of press in the country. See that? How's, how's that in, in, in India? There's no shortage of, of uh, young people who want to be journalists and it always amazes and impresses me whenever I visit campuses to see the enthusiasm. And frankly, my message to them is also that they should not feel overly despondent and even though I painted a bleak, bleak picture, uh, that's really about the political aspect of journalism, right? Uh, there's, there are vast areas of journalism where uh, even, the, even the most compromised media house is looking for professional talent and is prepared to nurture professional talent. So there's, uh, of course, it's possible that you reach a level or reach a stage where you get fed up and you get frustrated, uh, but there's plenty of great work to be done and there's plenty of great work that's being done. Uh, so as of now, I don't see any problem in motivating young people either to turn to journalism or uh, indeed whenever we advertise, we are flooded with applications. And in Istanbul, is it, is it, is it, uh, is it young people's wish to, to join your news organization um, and to be harassed by state agencies and <laughs> not be allowed to travel and uh, refuse to renew of your like passport conflict. and uh, no there is also enthusiasm in turkey uh, but what, something not like personally that i'm not um, um, very um, fond of happened in turkey and because of all this repression and because of the attacks from the government um, the media landscape also got very much polarized in turkey which I mean by um, the media organizations, uh, the traditional media organizations and uh, the journalists, reporters, the editors working for traditional media organize, uh, organizations, all of a sudden found themselves um, as activists on social media. And that was because they are also citizens of this, um, this country. And when uh, their rights uh, were being violated, they felt the need to say something uh, out in the open. But this, in fact, I think poisoned journalism furthermore. Although I'm like, I share their criticism of the government, but then we are like, our public face is that we are journalists. So uh, we have to put a distance between our feelings and, we, we, and the facts. So this, um, this principle is very much destroyed by it, not only by the pro-government uh, media organizations, mm. but also the critical ones. And that's why I find youngsters trying to join our organizations. And I, I look at them and they are like political activists. Yeah. And unfortunately, the digital landscape and, the, you know, like because they want to they want to be present on Facebook, they want to be present on Instagram, TikTok and this stuff. And, you know, why, when do you have the time to go out in the field and learn reporting? I Absolutely. So you would underline then your professionalism in order to separate yourself and distance yourself a little bit also awesome. from these activists who claim to be journalists. I mean, we need to remodel um, the mediums and the ownership styles. But there, is, there are things that we cannot remodel. That's the content. That's the integrity. That's your loyalty uh, to the facts. And this, you know, these principles of universal journalism is somehow um, not only in, in a country like Turkey, also because I, you know, spent uh, uh, the three years of my last five years in the U.S. and also there, the media has been very much polarized. And I think that's a setback to you know, uh, journalism in a global sense. And that's something that we, I think, really need to reflect on. 
I would like to open the floor for some questions and I would also like to encourage people watching us from abroad to send comments and questions. Uh, so far, there's not been a lot going on here on my, on my cell phone from, from, from the Zoom chat. Are there any comments and questions from the audience here in Vienna? It's not the case, it's all very clear then. So then we can continue our conversation. Um, one thing that, and Veronica mentioned that uh, in her introduction that uh, strikes me is, um, I mean, repression can also, can not only necessarily be repression by uh, harassing you, but also by ignoring you. So, and I read somewhere preparing for this, uh, for this conversation that you were quoted as saying that meanwhile, there are even Hungarian government officials who maybe not openly, but who start talking to you guys because all of a sudden they realize this, you are a force to reckon with. Yeah. How does one, how does one deal with that? And how does one portray uh, the trickle, the small trickle of information mm -hmm. to, to the audience, you know, like, are you saying, sorry, but government isn't talking to us and they're refusing command or how do you yeah. deal with that? Uh, first of all, I'd like to emphasize is, it's this, this thing that you were just talking about. It's not just about telex, but the whole critical independent media field have, have, has problems with uh, access to information. But uh, we need to be creative. So that's what we are. Uh, basically, uh, we go everywhere with a video camera and we approach politicians who previously didn't answer to public interest uh, topics and we ask them uh, on, on the street why they are heading to their governmental meeting or, and stuff. Uh, and, and then we can show to our readers that that's what we do and that's what we try and that's how they do not answer. That can be one method. Uh, but as I mentioned, Telex is one year old. In the beginning, they totally ignored us, never answered to anything. But since uh, we reached uh, a quite a large audience, we have around 600,000 readers a day. Uh, the Hungarian population is 10 million. Then uh, I think the, the power of our audience became so big that they decided, okay, we need to they need to answer. They, it's, it's not the usual case that they answer, but, but we are invited to the weekly governmental press uh, uh, conferences. Uh, there are some outlets which is not, and there are occasions when we ask their questions because they are not invited. So um, it is frustrating, uh, but we, since uh, the situation is going on, for almost a decade, we we just have these new uh, methods to gather information from of the record uh, interviews, background interviews, and sometimes we can convince uh, governmental people to go on the record and and uh, and discuss uh, public interest stuff uh, to us. That was that an experience you of also made in Nigeria? I mean. In some countries on the continent, we have experienced during the pandemic that government all of a sudden realized that media is important to convey the message of whatever, washing your hands, social distancing and all that. Have you seen a change in, in the governmental approach towards you? Yeah, I mean, I think just like she said, the more they find the medium influential, they, they turn full circle and then come out to you. But the little point you made about the pandemic is a very important one. Uh, for the very first time in the history of Nigeria, um, journalists were accorded this uh, important role as frontline workers. Um, otherwise, you know, in situations like these, uh, you're always crowded out. Um, so, I mean, that helps a, a little bit. So, you want to imagine that, you know, uh, a situation of a pandemic, you know, that it's important to really have uh, truthful, credible information as part of the solution strategy. Um, so that worked at that point. But for us, you know, just because we're an investigative newspaper, we have a tradition of very uh, adversarial relationship to administration. So um, 
Uh, it was very tough at the beginning, but now, I mean, give or take, it's probably one of the most influential newspaper in Nigeria. So you're forced to listen and uh, seek you out. Yeah, that's how it's. Uh, so, I mean, there have been there have been cases in Europe and elsewhere where uh, news publications that got funding from abroad, philanthropic funding, ran into legal troubles mm -hmm. with their respective governments. Russia is a particular case. Hungary is another one. How do you go about that in Turkey? Or are there many hidden avenues that uh, one can use? I mean, there are no hidden avenues. And if you're getting foreign funding, uh, I think you should, and not think, you should be very transparent about the whole thing. And that's not only uh, your obligation uh, to your readership, to your audience, but also this is what um, most of the funders, the foreign funders are expecting from you. you have, it's not like, you know, Overnight, they kind of leave a bag of money under your pillow. It's 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 a set of agreements, and I think um, in countries like us, and at least this is what we do. I mean, we we do get foreign funding, but uh, nothing compared to um, um, what was the the, the PDF um, PDF experiment in the previous the continent. Huh? The continent. the continent so nothing near what the continent gets but still and what happened in august just uh, uh, one and a half month ago is that um we have uh, a colleague uh, who is also a member of our ipi national um committee Rushan, and he is running a, a tv channel mediascope and uh, all of a sudden uh, one of the and this is not a pro-government uh, uh, digital media, by the way, it's, it, it, they call themselves nationalists, whatever. So they ran a story saying that these are not saying, but implying that they are traitors because they got this funding from the Crest Foundation in the US. And they implied in their story that that foundation was apparently CIA. <laughs> so this is what happens in countries like Turkey. And when you get foreign funding, you're either like German agents or American agents, uh, and you are trying to bring down the governments on the orders of foreign governments. This is, um, this is kind of like this conspiracy theory. And unfortunately, this, this conspiracy theory has like people buy it. Mm -hmm. And people even from the, the opposition ranks, they buy it. And because this all of a sudden casts shadow on your independence, you're not independent. You're maybe independent from the Erdogan government, but you're not independent from any other government. So this is like the, the sword of Damocles on you. And you have to be very careful about, you know, your resources and getting funding. funding. Um, and I'll just give you an example. We don't have any funding from the US, any US NGO or US government organization. Uh, but uh, the 4th of July on the Independence Day, uh, the US ambassador in Ankara decided the first time, uh, I mean, they, as you know, they kind of like, if they want to give a message in a country, they write editorials and they kind of pitch it to the, the most important newspaper of the country. And that happened to be Hurriyet in the past. And this year they called me and they said, would you like to publish ambassador's uh, piece, uh, the opinion piece? And I was like, okay, thank you. Because it's, uh, it's the first time they go for digital. And we published it obviously. Um, <laughs> and the question on my mind was, I is it a good thing to publish? Because the thing is, we don't get any funding, but because we are publishing uh, the opinion piece of the US ambassador in Ankara, you kind of like give them um, ammunition. But on the other hand, I, I told you, we are dependent on this editorial model. The subscription is not an option yet. And then in, on, in five years, it's only like 50% of everything we spend is covered by advertisements. And that's, you know, like I, every day I wake up and I say, okay, the funders, you know, God bless them and give them like long life. And, you know, COVID was really uh, chilling for us mm -hmm. because these people make money elsewhere. And they kind of like donate to us. And if their business work, uh, you know, was going down because of the restrictions during the pandemic, 
we didn't know how to survive. So, I mean, I'm very uh, proud of the work that we are doing, but if you ask me um, this, if this is sustainable, my question is, I'm not sure. Uh, I might answer, sir. See that, um, I think when it comes to tackling what was termed here as repression or challenges or dire circumstances, one important aspect to counter these is experience, what we call gray-haired people in the newsroom. Um, now you are gray-haired and Dapo is gray-haired, but we have seen in many newsrooms in the world a trickle of experienced elder editors and publishers <coughs> um, who went for greener pastures or went into um, rehab or into inner exile or whatever. Do you face similar problems in India that you have young people in newsrooms who just don't have the experience to recall what in a similar situation their famous editor in chief 20 years ago would have done and maybe we could get some advice from him and so on and so forth. Well, our newsroom is very young and uh, our desk, for example, or even our reporters uh, probably younger than the national average. Um, but we overcompensate by the fact that the three three founding editors are all uh, gray-haired. And with uh, my colleague Siddharth Bhatia likes to say that between the three of us, we have 100 years of experience. And I say, hang on, that doesn't sound so nice. you know. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, I think a certain amount of experience uh, and institutional memory helps to negotiate the way through. But I think um, uh, I think the young folk in our newsroom also have uh, bring very definite strengths to, to bear. I think their ability to, to spot a story, uh, to think of different forms of narration. I have a young colleague, for example, who um, made a video, a short video on, uh, because The Wire was part of the Pegasus project. Uh, and there were lots of people in India that whose phones were infected. Um, and so we, we made a, he made a two and a half minute video <clears throat> explaining to lay viewers what it means for your phone to be infected. Uh, and it was in the form of a, I could never have thought, I could never have imagined such a scenario where he, uh, it's a, it's a, you have a WhatsApp chat between a journalist and a source. And uh, I'll send the link to people so they, they can see it later on YouTube. But, you know, and that was a very effective form of storytelling. Yeah. So I think that, uh, I think every newsroom, whether under repression or not, needs a good mix of uh, people with experience, but especially the young. Thank you very much, Siddharth. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica. Thank you, Sanzu, and thank you, Dapo. Thank you. In an hour, we can discuss a few aspects of the daily challenges publishers face, and we can draw comparisons and establish contexts that are important for us and for so many media houses. That is what we tried in this one hour discussion to see possibilities and avenues for cooperation and to benefit from an exchange of experiences. Because as many of us know, doing media in a hostile or non-favorable environment is the reality for the majority of media houses worldwide. Thank you very much for being here with us this afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you.